other story about David's dysfunctional family. Oh my goodness, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. What a, what a bunch of stories. For a, a number of weeks here at Epworth, we've been following the biblical story of King David and his family. And what a story it has been. Pastors Kate and Bill have told and reflected on tales that I know well and some that I've long since forgotten if I ever knew them. I mean, I tried reading the Bible when I was in fifth grade and I read it all the way through, but I don't remember a whole lot. I appreciate Kate and Bill's thoughtful interpretations and I'm humbled to follow in their footsteps today. So today's story in 2 Samuel 18 is a sad one. It ends with David mourning the death of his son, Absalom. Back in chapter 13, we can read how David's son, Amnon, raped his half-sister, Tamar, David's daughter, and essentially left her out on the trash heap. What did David do to punish Amnon? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing which is absolutely appalling. We're not talking about saints here, are we? Absalom was David's son and the full brother of Tamar. After the rape, Absalom opened his home to, the wound, to his wounded sister, Tamar. Absalom waited a couple of years, and then when the time was right, Absalom ordered a mob-style hit on his half-brother, Amnon. King David was furious. Amnon was his first son. So Absalom hid out for three years until his father calmed down and then with some help was able to more or less reconcile with his father. However, David still never acknowledged the damage that was done to Tamar. She is never mentioned again in the story. Well, it's likely that Absalom still held kind of a grudge about that against his father, which would explain why Absalom eventually formed his own army and attempted to overthrow his father by force. What do we have, Godfather, King, King of Thrones, Game of Thrones? David had his soldiers fight back against Absalom and his army with the proviso that they not harm his son, Absalom. Well, for David, unfortunately, his soldiers did not obey. And they killed Absalom in cold blood, while the scripture says he hung from his hair in a tree. Here's where we find David weeping. Absalom! Absalom! My son. What a mess. You can't make this stuff up. What a crisis for David and his family. Not to that degree, but it reminds me of many families I've, during the, the time I was in the pastorate and, and now in counseling. Parents make poor decisions that harm their children or set them against one another. Children, sometimes from loving families, make poor decisions that cause their parents and their communities grief. Alcoholism and addiction complicate everything. Relationships become toxic. To try to save themselves, people back away, as Absalom did for a few years, or leave their families completely. Lest we think that we're safe, I believe all families have some degree of dysfunction. As long as imperfect human beings belong to families, we all face dysfunction. Were it not for the grace of God, shall we say? Showing us how to forgive and love each other, even when we do not deserve it, we could all be in far worse condition. David's family is a classic, if not extreme, example of a dysfunctional family. Can you say David's family puts the funk in dysfunctional? Yeah. I mean, don't they seem crazy? Sorry, I just broke my own rules. 
Crazy is a bad word in the mental health field. Mental health providers are not supposed to say crazy. Crazy doesn't exist in our DSM, the diagnostic manual that nearly all mental health providers use. Frankly, I use the word crazy to bring attention to a major barrier that I think keeps people from seeking out mental health services, and that is stigma. I think stigma is the number one reason why people don't walk through our doors. People don't want to be thought of, either by themselves or by others, as crazy. The majority of people who come to me for counseling are not by any stretch of the imagination crazy. They're dealing with anxiety or depression or something similar that keeps them from having the whole and full and meaningful life that they want. Now, some people with common mental illnesses are able to handle the problems of life without needing to see a mental health provider or take medication, but certainly not everyone. Who knows what a little Prozac might have done in David's family to help things out. The fact that my schedule is often completely full is a testament to the reality that many people know they need help and are willing to ask for it. Seeking help for anxiety, depression, bipolar, or what have you should be no different than visiting a physical therapist or a dermatologist. There are things that we can do in therapy that often work very well. Techniques to learn, thinking to change, thought diaries to keep, new behaviors to begin, and old behaviors to stop. There are difficult stories to tell, stories that can't be shared with even those closest to us, but they can be a source of healing when we finally say them out loud in a safe space to somebody who cares. So what can you do if you're in a family like David's or that has some other serious dysfunction? I've got some suggestions. One, have a lot of love. Have a lot of love for your family and love for yourself. You're valuable, you're important, you're precious in God's sight. Know that. Second, set appropriate boundaries to protect yourself and others in your family. For example, if someone has this pattern of wasting all of their money, don't give them more, kind of. I'm in a small group and we talked about this last night and we realized there are shades of gray. When do you stop helping someone and start enabling them? Where is that line? It's hard to know and you can't judge if you're not in that family. Be helpful, but recognize when helping hurts. Healthy boundaries are our friends. Seek help in counseling, both for yourself and, if possible, for as many family members as you can gather into the room and who are willing to participate. Look for a licensed mental health provider who may be a counselor like myself, a psychologist, or a social worker. Know that counselors often specialize in certain conditions and populations. For example, I typically see individuals who are 14 years of age or older. I don't tend to see children, families, or couples, but there are plenty of folks who do. If you're looking for someone with help in your whole family situation, it's helpful to see a counselor who is licensed in marriage and family counseling. There are two good places to look for counselors, the list of preferred providers with your insurance company and on psychologytoday.com, where most of us do some advertising and describe our services in more detail. There are some helpful books you can read. I don't know if they made it to the, okay, they didn't make it to the screen. I'll make sure that the office has a list that can, uh, can give these out to you. 
One is called Stop Walking on Eggshells. Anybody ever feel like they do that in their families? Got to be real careful so you don't hurt somebody's feelings or trigger something. It's a book about living with persons who suffer from personality disorders, most specifically borderline personality disorders. It can cause a mess in a family if it's not treated. Another book is How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. The book's got a good title and it has cartoons in it, which makes it a winner for me. Here's a book with a title I love. Get out of my life. But first, could you drive me and Cheryl to the mall? <laughs> I love the title, and the book's pretty good, too. Feeling Good by David Burns, a classic self-help guide that one can use to heal from depression. So those are some things that, that you can do if you're in those families. What can you do if others you care about are in these dysfunctional families? First of all, I'd say don't judge. Families are complicated. Can I hear an amen? All right, somebody knows that. Sometimes parents do the best they can, and their children still make poor choices. It's hard for insiders to know the whole story, let alone outsiders. All families have our battle scars and complications, some beginning generations ago. Don't judge. Offer some grace to a family in trouble. Listen well. Share as little of your story as possible. Good listeners are hard to find, but oh, so needed. Don't give advice unless someone asks for it. Trained counselors ourselves rarely give advice. We were told in school that something like 90% of all our advice is wrong anyway, and 99% of the time our counselees won't take it. It's best to listen and give people tools to help them solve their own problems. Don't give unsolicited advice. Don't gossip. Now this is a tricky one sometimes. You want to pray for this family. But if you want others to pray for them, don't turn a prayer request into gossip. Share as little identifying information as you can so that well-meaning prayer doesn't turn into something it's not meant to be. And again, refer your friends, this family, to somebody who can help. Above all, don't give up on families. Thanksgiving is coming. That's a holiday that makes some of us joyful and some of us very worried. What's going to happen around the table on Thanksgiving? How are we doing as a family? Don't judge. Be gracious. Be caring. Think before you speak. And above all, trust in the God who wants the best for us. As John read from Psalm 130, Israel trusts the Lord. He has always mercy and he has the power to save you. Israel, the Lord will save you from all of your sins. This is the good news. Amen and let all God's children say, Amen. amen.